Church, we can give that testimony this morning, can't we? That our God is faithful. That never once has he forsaken us. Never once have we turned and cried out and called upon the Lord that he has not heard our cry. Amen? Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter four. While you're flipping there, I'm gonna go ahead and just correct your minds and your attitudes. Ephesians, or sorry, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17 says, thou shall not covet thy neighbor's shirt. Okay? So let's just deal with that up front. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's shirt. It's a, there we go. I got one whoop. Can I get some more? Do I have some Aggies here? There we go. There we go. Now, you're going to come out in full force when these seniors are across the stage, and about half of them say they're going to AM. There we go. All right, let me remind you about next week. Next week's a uh, really exciting week. Uh, I'm only teasing you with what is actually coming next week. It's gonna be a very important week in the life of our church, okay? So you want to be here, we'll record it. Uh, so if you can't be here, you can tune in online. Also, next Sunday night is a vision night where we'll spend time Worshiping together, praying together, uh, but also talking about where the Lord is leading us. Now, we've been walking through the book of Ephesians this uh, spring after Easter, and we've been looking intently at church matters. Just walking through this middle section of Ephesians and finding out repeatedly this refrain in regards to Paul highlighting the importance of the local church. I figured I'd start this morning with uh, a true illustration, catch this, of a young minister in Oklahoma who went to this little long-standing church in hopes of reviving the ministry. So you can imagine that his eyes were big and full of dreams, of hopes for the future. He thought he could turn that little church around and he gave it his best effort week after week but all to no avail. Finally, he had one last idea. Oddly, it seemed to work. He announced in the local newspaper on Saturday that the church had died. And that Sunday afternoon, there would be a funeral service at the church itself. And all who wished could attend. For the first time in years, the place was packed. In fact, people were standing outside on their tiptoes, uh, looking through the windows to see this unusual funeral service for a church. Now, to their shock, most of them got there 20 to 30 minutes early to get a seat that there was actually a casket down front and flowers on top of it. He told the people that as soon as the eulogy was finished, they could pass by and view the remains of the dearly beloved church that they were putting to rest that day. They could hardly wait until he finished the eulogy. And finally, when he was done, slowly he pushed the flowers aside and opened the casket. And they filed by, one by one, to look in and to leave with a sheepish look upon their face, a bit of guilt as they walked out the door. Because inside the casket, he had placed a large mirror. And as they walked by, they saw the church that had died. Now, can you believe that that's an actual true story? Can you believe how attractional we've become as a culture to forsake the glorious truths of the Bible that we are the church, that we are the living temple of God. And yet you could put on a lights and mirror show and that will draw a crowd rather than just the simple truth that when we gather together, there is a unique flavor. The Holy Spirit shows up, listens to our prayers, inhabits our praises as we open the word of God. So we've been walking through our sermon series 
on church matters in the book of Ephesians. And we come to another magnificent passage today about the health and maturity (coughs) of the local church and what it looks like. So listen as I read in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7 through uh, 16. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Remember that word, gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that uh, he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also. He who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs in the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to an incredibly powerful and challenging passage this morning, Father, I pray that your word will hold our attention that we will look eagerly with excitement, anticipation, everybody in this room and under the sound of my voice of those who are tuning in online to hear what you have for us. Father, we pause to confess how attractional we've become, how simply entertained wanting to see the next best thing rather than to open your word and to dive deep and to think hard and to persevere with with a strength in regards to your word, to what you are saying to us. Forgive us, Father. Give us the patience and the ability to hear the whisper of your Holy Spirit, to hear your word and to be changed by it. We press into you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I have a confession to make. That is, for years, I have read this passage and not had a clue what it was talking about. All of that descended and ascended stuff and kind of this back and forth sort of thing, this Old Testament quotation. But this week, I got to study and I got to press into, and let me just tell you, it is absolutely magnificent the illustration that Paul borrows from Psalm 68, okay? Paul is going to quote Psalm 68, but he is borrowing the entire movement that takes place. So here's what happens in Psalm 68. God is pictured as marching in front of Israel. Remember how the pillar of uh, the cloud would go in front of them? and the the fire would protect them at night. God is pictured (coughs) marching in front of Israel after they've come out of Egypt. It is a king who is triumphantly processing in front of the army and all of his captives. He is marching in front. And through the Psalm, he goes to Mount Sinai and the earth trembles. Opposing kings and armies flee at his sight. (coughs) And his people rest because they are under his protection. 
And then God leaves Sinai. This is in uh, Psalm 68. God gets up and leaves Sinai and makes his way towards Jerusalem. Mount Zion. And he ascends up. In this triumphal procession as a king. And he has thousands upon thousands of his army with him. And a whole host of captives as he marches and ascends up. And the streets are lined with all of those who are casting their gifts as a way of honoring the king. They are casting their gifts at his feet. Now, Paul quotes verse 18 of chapter 68. <clears throat> but he uses this picture of God walking into Jerusalem. He uses it as a picture of Jesus and his ascension into the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay? So Jesus, the conquering king, has overcome the grave. He has defeated Satan. And on his way up to the heavenly Jerusalem, Paul changes one key word. Instead of the whole host casting their gifts upon the king, now Paul says, Jesus is the one who is giving spiritual gifts to his church on his way up to the heavenly Jerusalem, okay? Before he leaves, in his ascension, the king is passing out spiritual gifts to his church. That's the picture. So you start back with verse seven. He says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. You don't mind if I walk down here and get my water, get my scratchy throat a little wet. I know you're thinking, was he going to talk like that the whole time? So in verse 7, it says that grace was given. Now that grace there means ministry grace. Not salvation grace, but ministry grace. The ability to perform the ministry that God has called each and every one of us to. It sounds a lot like Romans 12, 6, okay, where he explains, we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. So let's go back to where we were last week. Because at the beginning of seven, uh, sorry, at the beginning of chapter four, Paul talks about now we are called to walk worthy. And all of last week, he talked about the unity that exists with us as a local church, okay? That there is to be a unity, that we are supposed to be humble and gentle and patient with one another in this unity as we do life together. And now he adds on to this, because this is key, that unity does not mean sameness or conformity. Okay? Unity does not mean we're all the same, but rather that there is a diversity of roles and ability that Jesus gives out. And that diversity is beautiful. So think about it like this. Would you say that for a football team to be united, everyone has to play the same position? Could you imagine 11 quarterbacks in a huddle? All right, they think they're united, but there's only one ball. We'll see how long they're really united in purpose, okay? Unity means to have the same purpose or the same goal, not that we all do the same job. And that's Paul's point here, that Jesus, in his ascension, generously gives a diversity of spiritual gifts to his church. And so in verse 11, he begins listing, and he begins listing with leaders. 
And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Okay, I'm gonna explain this real quick. In a technical sense, apostles and prophets refer to specific positions that existed in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and in the early church. Okay, the apostles were the 12. But in a more general sense, the word apostle means sent ones. And in a general sense, what a prophet did is he applied God's word to God's people. Evangelists are those who are gifted to share the gospel with other people. Now we know scripturally that all people are called to share the gospel, okay? But an evangelist, his job is to teach others the tricks of the trade, right? If you're good at evangelism, you can teach the rest of the church how to do it because they may not be as gifted at it. Pastors, oversee the flock and shepherd. So it is my job to nurture, to defend, to feed, to protect, to know, and to sacrifice for you. Teachers would refer to those who God has given the gift of the ability to digest God's word and then Teach it in a way that is easy to understand and apply to your life. And so we have growth group teachers and Bible study teachers, many teachers throughout the church. Now, what do all of these have in common? Well, they are leadership positions that teach people from God's word. Okay? So God has gifted some to lead and to teach. Jesus gave spiritual gifts on his way up to heaven. Now look at verse 12. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service. To the building up of the body of Christ. You gotta catch this because it's foundational. I know I've been teaching and we're diving deep. But catch this because it's foundational. So I am gifted to be your shepherd. God has graciously given me that ability to be able to teach and to be your shepherd. Now ask this question. What is the end of my gift? What is the end of my giftings? So if you're a young preacher and you're thinking about being a preacher, you have to ask this question. Is it for me? Is the end of my gift for me that I would grow a large ministry that lots of people would like me, that lots of people would want to sit and soak underneath my teaching ministry? Is that the end of my gift? No, not at all. Not according to this verse. The end of the gift is to equip the saints. You, the local church for your ministry. That's the end of the gift. I'm the coach. You are the players. I don't play. I'm not in the game. You're in the game. Or let's say it another way. When we are a healthy church, when we are functioning as a local church in a way that honors Jesus and he is happy and pleased with us, what does that look like? I would say this. When each and every one of you know how God has gifted you and what your ministry is. Does that make sense? We are healthy, Jesus is pleased with us when every single one of you knows God has gifted me to do this. This is my kingdom purpose. This is my kingdom adventure, okay? Leaders equip, so you need leaders to equip you. You need equipping, but the goal is for the saints to do the work of ministry, 
I want you to turn to your neighbor and I want you to say, you have a ministry. <laughs> now you, you can do it a little better than that. <laughs> you have a ministry. I've told you guys before, one of the driest times of my life was when I was in seminary. And I couldn't figure it out because I was being poured into like never before. I couldn't figure it out because I, I was still dry, even though I was getting magnificent teaching. And then one day I started serving as a nursing home pastor. Okay, I started going around and teaching at and preaching at different assisted living centers. And suddenly I became alive. You know why? Because God met me through the use of my spiritual gifts. Do you know why the Dead Sea is dead? Because water only flows in. Nothing ever flows out. That's why it's dead. You were not meant to be the Dead Sea. You were not meant to sit and to soak underneath preaching week in, week out. You were meant to be equipped and to do. That's what God is calling us to, each and every one of us, that the Spirit will meet you in the ministry that God has given you. Think about that. The Holy Spirit promises to meet you in ministry. And I was dry because I hadn't met him teaching yet. <clears throat> A couple of weeks ago, I sat down with John Nip to ask him to talk about uh, renewing our Wednesday night meals. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and they're coming back, all right? Top secret, they're coming back. <clears throat> But we sat and talked about the difficulty and complexity of, of doing Wednesday night meals, the number of hours that that requires, all the prep work, all that stuff. But in the end, he looked at me and he just said this, Pastor, I know that God has given me life experiences and equipped me and that this is me and Marie's ministry. I gotta do it. It's our ministry. Listen, God has generously gifted each and every one of us with a diversity of gifts. The question is, is do you know what they are? Do you know your ministry? Sadly, most Christians view themselves as fans, cheering on the show. But that's to get the imagery all wrong. You are the players. You are on the field. You are in the game. To quote Paul David Tripp, your life is much bigger than a good job, an understanding spouse, a non-delinquent kids. It's bigger than beautiful gardens and nice vacations and fashionable clothes. You see, in reality, you are part of something immense, something that began before you were born and something that will continue after you die. God is rescuing fallen humanity, transporting them into his kingdom and progressively changing them into his likeness. And he wants you to be a part of it. Think about that. He wants you to be a part of it. And it's my job to equip you. And we are healthy when you know what your ministry is. So that when we give to Baby Bottle Boomerang and you go to that table on the way out, you are equipping a local mission partner and giving towards a ministry that helps extend and reach the arm of Christ. When you go on a Saturday night to take it to the street and serve the meals homeless with Kenny, you are an extension arm of the church reaching out to our community. When you work in childcare, when you visit hospitals and visit those in need, when you make a meal and give it to new parents, 
when you serve on administrative committees. I mean, yuck, administrative committees. You are using the gifts that God has given you to advance the kingdom of God. Now, I need to quickly move into this final section because as Paul talks about, when we all use our spiritual giftings, when we function the way that is healthy and Jesus wants us to, he says, we become a mature body, healthy and strong. No longer like fickle, gullible children. I had a youth one Wednesday night pull me aside and, and tell me that he was, had gone through some things in life and he was pretty frustrated with our youth group and he told me that he had thought about it and he decided to become an atheist. as if God stopped existing because he had a bad time of it. You see, children are tossed around by their emotions, by the trials and difficulty that come along. They're tossed around. But mature people, what makes for maturity no longer being tossed from here to there? Do you know what this passage says? What makes you mature? It's when the body functions together and is strong. When the body is, not you as an individual. I want you to consider for a moment how your body works. So let's say my left elbow itches. It doesn't just vibrate real quick and itch itself. What does it do? It sends a signal to your brain that says, hey, tell my right arm and hand to get over here and to itch me. Isn't that incredible? All of this is taking place. You didn't think about it, you just did that. You cannot be mature without the local church. Let that sink in. Here's where we are culturally. You can listen to podcasts. You can have your own worship music. You could attend seminary in a culture where 60% of religious people say, I don't belong to a church. Listen to me. You cannot be mature without the local church. Don't take that up with me. Take that up with the Bible. Now, let me explain to you why. One, because you have to learn to lay down your personal preferences for the good of your brothers and sisters. Okay? You have to put it into practice with your brothers and sisters. When I got my first roommate in college, it took about a month for the fun to wear off before we had to have our first apartment meeting. Okay? And it sounded something like this. You don't do the dishes. All right? Well, you ate my cereal. And you walked in with muddy shoes and left footprints all over the place. And you never clean up. And quickly I learned how selfish I was. And the need to lay down my preferences for the good of the whole. And then I got married. And quickly I learned how selfish I was and the need to lay down my preferences for the good of the whole. And then I had kids. And I thought I was selfish before. I couldn't remember staying up one night with Ian all night in the middle of the night trying to get him to feed, trying to get him to settle down. His days and nights were mixed up. And suddenly, for the first time, I had this thought, my goodness, my parents used to do this for me. It was the first time I ever had that thought. I called my mom the next day and said, thank you, thank you. I cannot believe it. You see, every one of those relationships caused me 
to lay down more and more my personal preferences. They matured me. Now, obviously, only so much because I still jump off roofs. <laughs> you can't mature as a Christian until you enter into the messiness of a local church and you learn to love your brother and sister who are different and diverse from you. It's just what the Bible says. In a culture where overwhelmingly people say, I don't need church. Secondly, you mature when we're together as a body because Catch this, because you meet Christ in their spiritual giftings, okay? So earlier I said, you meet Christ through your spiritual giftings, but this is also true. Others meet Christ through your spiritual giftings, okay? They meet Christ. So let's use Mark and the choir as an example, okay? Now, certainly they have natural talents and they work hard at their craft, okay? But Mark would also tell you that it's a calling, a ministry that is a calling. So you know what makes for good worship on Sunday morning? It's when you leave here and you say, wow, did we meet Jesus? Did we enter into the throne room of God? Not when you say, wow, was Mark incredible or was that solo incredible? But when you, you lose, you disappear and you simply say, we were ushered before the throne room of God. That's the use of spiritual gifts. You meet Jesus through other people who are not like you through their spiritual gifts. So, so let me give you uh, another example that's not so spiritual. I'm not very gifted administratively. It is for that reason that Gary organizes and runs all of my meetings, okay? He goes, he organizes them, he leads them, he does all of that stuff. I mean this in all sincerity. I see Jesus in those gifts. I see Jesus in those gifts. It's what Paul told the Romans <laughs> in chapter one, verse 11. He said, for I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that I may be encouraged together with you, each of us by the other's faith. This bearing fruit one to another J. Vernon McGee once took a trip to South Africa. And as he was traveling through a small town, he saw groups of boys clustered around a circle in the dust on the side of the road. The famous preacher realized that the boys were playing a game that he had played as a boy growing up. They were playing marbles. As McGee came closer, he noticed that the children had substituted the small stones that were clear, okay, that were always clear, they had substituted those for a different kind of stone. However, he realized that they weren't ordinary stones. They were diamonds. These children had no idea what the true value of the stones really was. They were treating the most precious stone in the entire world without regard for its true worth. They were playing marbles with diamonds. I can't help but think how often we play church and do not realize her magnificent value. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus all across this room. As your word has pressed down upon your people, that you would be calling and equipping, that minds would be racing saying, what is my ministry? How have you gifted me? Father, your word says you have generously gifted us. 
generously given ministry and grace upon grace so that we can walk worthy of you. And that we are mature, that we are healthy, that we are strong. When each one of us is supporting and holding up the other, doing acts of service, administrative gifts, teaching, words of wisdom, knowledge that comes from you, the gift of interceding prayer on behalf of others and to to pray healing over them. Father, help us as your local church to walk worthy of you. To not be so attractional, but to have a flavor that is different. That is your Holy Spirit working in each and every one of us. Help us, Jesus. We need you. We love you. It's in your name we pray. 